what I'm going to show today, so I'm, I'm interested um, in, in finding ways that we can incorporate more domain knowledge into computational methods. That's a kind of personal interest of mine. And today what I'm going to show from our group um, are two uh, projects on heterogeneity. The first is about aligning maps, accounting with some approaches that maybe would account for heterogeneity using um, computational optimal transport, some ideas from that. And then also another method that assumes a parametric forward model. So with coordinates, with equations, with a point cloud of connected balls and springs. And uh, looking at 2D to 3D reconstruction and, and that problem. And both, both relate to coordinate-based based methods, which I'm interested in. So the first one is, imagine you have two maps. How do you align them? Well, there's no initial point correspondence. It's not like having a PDB map where, you know, this point is, you know, alpha carbon number five, and in this other PDB model, that has been sort of moved here. You just have a bunch of voxels with intensity in them. And furthermore, with maps, there's bits and pieces of heterogeneity. This work is uh, the main work of uh, another PhD student, Ariane, and these are some of the other people involved. Okay, so first I'm gonna talk about the Wasserstein distance. So imagine we have N bakeries and N restaurants. And in, in Vancouver, we usually talk about sushi restaurants, and, but Ken's French, so, so he lets us use the uh, bakery example. And each bakery and restaurant produces and consumes the same amount of bread. And there's some cost matrix to transport, to walk with however many baguettes under your arm from one bakery to the store, to whether it would be the restaurant, whether it be, they'd be used. And the goal is to minimize the amount of distance people walk carrying these pieces of bread. And a transport plan is a one-to-one -one matching between bakeries and restaurants. And it, it's, the goal is to find an optimal plan that, that uh, minimizes the amount of weight people are carrying around. And this goes back to uh, digging, in the Napoleonic times, digging trenches and transporting earth and mange. And, and there can be many different plans, and you have the optimal one. So here, the, in the place of bread in this sort of 2D problem, you would have a, a 3D map and uh, intensity of, of the Coulombic uh, potential and, uh, and displacement in 3D. In around the 50s, with work um, uh, around the Second World War and optimizing resource allocation, the Soviet mathematician Kantorovich relaxed some assumptions and gave another formulation where you could break up pieces of bread. There, one bakery could deliver to multiple restaurants. And, and uh, so this is kind of more the, there's been further work and allowing kind of spread and dust, regularizing things entropically. But more or less, we can be thinking about uh, transporting, displacing density from one map into another. We, our lab has applied this to morphing density maps into each other. So here you see two panels. On the right, you have a Euclidean-based uh, interpolation, where there's these teleportation artifacts where density is just disappearing and reappearing. And on the left, uh, mass is being displaced. So it's, as I sort of see it, this is, um, suitable and works very well for local linear translations and, and perhaps some shears and maybe within a, a range of angular rotations. But um, if you have a complete, if, if the range is too large, if you, if you flip the kind of object upside down, then the density, there's no point correspondence, so the density just sort of morphs into the other. And yeah, so we published some work there on this uh, morpho T. What I'm going to talk about is, is using this for alignment, rigid body alignment problems. So you have two input density maps, 
and you want to find a rotation that um, and translation that ma that allow those maps to match well to each other as much as possible. And there's been, um, yeah, there's different methods out there. There's an interesting paper uh, called Vesper, a method that, that compares uh, different map-based alignment metrics that use correlation. Many of them use correlation. You can also work in, in Fourier space and do correlation. And there's uh, people often use this built-in command fitmap in Chimera. But there, the space that you're exploring, the rotational space can explode if you go to very high resolution. And there's uh, a high potential for getting stuck in local minima. And people might have encountered that when trying to align a map. If you, if you maybe get one helix off, it sort of locks into something else that only searches over, over uh, a finite range. And uh, so what did, what did we do? So one more idea about uh, some notation. Let's say we're, we have our transport plan between some distribution uh, X and Y. And, and uh, with our Kantorovich formulation, X3 uh, displaces its density to to sum to y1 and, and less to y2 and 3 and the most to y4. So we'll have an assignment, we'll call it as being assigned uh, to y4. And that's, that's the idea that we're using to, use, to have optimal transport give a point assignment. But how do we get points? So we have a bunch of uh, voxelized densities, and I guess every point is where the density cloud is, but how, do, how are they moving? And what we do is sample points from a map. So we, there's methods, uh, this is a topology representing networks, just uh, one method to fit a point cloud to, uh, to a map. And you fix the number of points you want, 100, 1,000, and they get diffused into a density. And so this is done once initially to have good coverage. Here's, um, here's uh, how it works. So we have some initial number of steps, some initial sampled points. This is our background map that we sample from. So we fix how many points you want to sample. And then we iterate through sampling some random point and then computing its rank, what points are close by. And then based on that, that defines how that point is displaced. So points are randomly sampled and then they're displaced based on what other points, where other points are. And then these are some weights that control the step. Here's an example of what it would look like for you to have some ground truth signal. This is, you could, this could be your 1D voxels, a bunch of points on there. And we would sample uh, some initial points, maybe it would be, wouldn't be exact if we had the, the less points you, you have, the less exact it's going to be. There's going to be more variance. And after diffusion, after running these topology representing networks, then it matches the initial distribution and is robust to how you've initially sampled it. Okay, so now this is an outline of the algorithm. Let me, let me walk, uh, walk you through it. So we have our two point clouds that we sampled with that topology representing network and a running estimate of what the optimal rotation is. And we just initialize it at the identity. The 
optimal transport plan is, is computed, every time the rotation changed, that optimal transport plan would change. So this is depending on what rotation you have, this is the optimal alignment. And then you select one point randomly. This helps with, it makes it stochastic, it helps with not getting jumping out of local minima. And uh, get the point correspondence for one point. And then take a gradient step that, minimize, that, that is in the direction of lowering that Euclidean distance of the point correspondence. So a little picture here. Here's our two point clouds that have been sampled on maps from two maps, and if we zoom in in some area, we have some one point here, we just happen to sample that one point. We have our transport plan that we computed from these two distributions, and that's the, uh, that's the, yeah, that's the point correspondence, and then the rotation changes to take, take a step to, to, to along that gradient, gradient in that direction. And so the learning rate is quite small, and the, um, the, the steps are, you know, if, if on the order of angstroms, they're 10 to the negative 3 or negative 4. And the, the some, there can be some saving on the transport plan. It doesn't have to, have to be computed from scratch. It can have like a warm start from the previous step and then be further refined with some synchron iterations. Okay, so what about performance comparing with Chimera's uh, fit map? So first, what, what is the kind of, what's being compared with the axis? So we choose some, some fixed axis, whatever direction, and then we apply a rotation away from ground truth. So we're aligning, you know, the, the same uh, map to itself. So we rotate it away a certain amount of degrees and then see if we can recapitulate the ground truth alignment, what the, what the angular difference is after it's aligned. So there's a few regions here. The, there's a region at low deviation where both methods are able to recapitulate the ground truth rotation to find the correct rotation. Then there's this region where uh, Chimera has uh, high residuals and, and align OT is still able to find the rotation. It's a stochastic algorithm, so there's some spread. And so sometimes, depend, you know, it depends, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. And then after a certain point, when it's rotated too far away, then both are performing poorly. What does this mean? This means that there's a larger range that we can seed uh, alignments in. This data set, uh, so we tried it on some structures that are different, that have different uh, pieces missing, different small domains missing. Maybe you can think of it as being, you know, about 90% the same. This data set came from uh, another paper that was used, Vesper, and they were using it to, to fit small pieces of uh, PDB models into maps, and also uh, uh, it was fast enough that they could have a query map and search the entire EMDB for matching maps using their approach. So you can see like a large piece missing here. Our approach fails when they would be too drastically different, when one would be, you know, half the size of the other, 10% of the other. And so here we see, it's the same trend as we kind of saw before. There's, there's three regimes. There's a small angular regime. Okay, so let me describe the columns. Here we have, so we, since we start with PDB structures, we can use a, um, a coordinate or PDB-based alignment tool to get a stand-in for a ground truth alignment. Although there's, they're not, you know, there's different maps, there's heterogeneities. Then we can 
uh, yeah, so that's this column. The Wachstenstein distance is a baseline level of the um, Wachstenstein distance between those, like a ground truth level of uh, transport. Then there's uh, how Khmer performs, it's angular residual, and also what the, what the Wachstenstein distance is in, in that metric. And then for a line on T, depending on the number of points that are used to sample from the topology representing network, 250 points to 1,000 points, how the angular residuals are. And in the, in the first kind of range, the angular residuals are, are low. They're both, both methods are performing well in the around 60 degrees. Uh, uh, the align OT is performing better. And then around 90 degrees, they're both performing poorly. The, the angular residual, the error is quite large here. Yeah, so here's a cartoon that explains, that shows a picture. Here's the aligned structures from the PDB, from MM Align. Alignment with Chimera, where you see it's not getting it right. Some disagreement there. And these are the point clouds that Align OT, that are unassigned, that Align OT learns to rotate. And this is the final rotation. So that's a handpicked example of success. The runtime, it's, um, we're working on optimizing this. It's, Chimera take is very fast, so it can take less than a second, half a second, something like that. It's, it's not really a fair comparison because it's benchmarking something that is in a plugin and might have some overhead compared with, uh, uh, you know, running things in a different environment. But as a ballpark for a, a thousand points, it takes a while, it takes uh, a minute, under one minute. It scales uh, quite dramatically with points, 250 points is five seconds. Uh, the convergence isn't optimized, so it's, you know, these aren't numbers that, that, uh, that, are, that stop in a smart way. They don't have early stops when the loss is plateauing. So we'll see how fast we can get this. That's some of the things we're working on right now. We, wanna, we do want to, we put in uh, Morpho T into Chimera, and we want to also uh, port uh, Align OT as a plugin for Chimera. There's pretty, there's good documentation for how to make a Chimera plugin, at least if things are in, in Python. And uh, to further work on the optimization and enable parallelism and take advantage of that. Syncorn can be sped up, for instance, on the GPU. Some of the matrix multiplications can be done in batch. There's independence between them. And then to uh, extend to partial OT when there's a small piece and a larger reference map. They have different mass. So this is part one on Align OT. And as part two, this is, so first of, first of all, this, uh, this, this part, it's still very much in its early stages. This is definitely not a problem I have cracked in any uh, significant way. Oh, I pressed something on the side here. Okay, I turned off it. Now I turned it on. So, but I'd like to present some preliminary work and uh, hopefully have some fruitful conversations with you this week and get working on the whiteboard and take advantage of being here in person. And I'm going to focus a bit on the forward model using a parametric forward model. And maybe, you know, at this stage, it's a bit of a, a series of, of simulation heuristics and speed up tricks to then use in simulation-based inference. And, um, and then we can be, you know, in the background, uh, and I've been thinking about how to, how does this fit together with uh, having um, an amortized proposal training from a neural net. So we had in the last talk uh, uh, a slide at the beginning where, where the forward model was presented as a deep neural net where the forward model would be parameterized by neural net network weights. 
So there would be a deep decoder in an in a autoencoder or VAE setting. But we could also think of having um, uh, the inverse problem parameterized by a deep net, where it consumes measurements and it gives estimates of the hidden variables, of the CTF, of the alignment, of uh, where atoms are. And then, a f and then a forward model, standard forward model, interpretable parametric forward model is used. But anyway, so this is in the point with, I'm not sort of set on the final neural net architecture, I've just used something very simple. In my, uh, in my reading of the thick volumes of methods of enzymology and, and a lot of the you know, earlier papers, there's a strong tradition of digital signal processing in cryo-EM. And uh, there's been a lot of great work and focusing on, on voxelized representations of the molecule. And, and it's, it's actually not that a complicated problem, right? We have this thing we want to reconstruct and there's this point spread function and CTF and Fourier space and some noise. But we actually, compared with many other areas of um, even computed tomography, like medical imaging or in, in geological sciences with seismology, we have a strong tradition of equations, of parametric equations. We know what we're imaging. We know what's in there. And uh, we, have, we can tap into uh, areas of molecular modeling that have a tradition of how to represent that that there were imaging atoms and we can have them be uh, Gaussian blobs, as Steve Leica was saying. Uh, what, how the point spread function is parameterized, what it's, what it's, it's uh, how to, what manifold it's on. So how does this fit together with simulation-based inference? In many areas of, from particle physics to hyper-sequencing to ecology, um, People are looking at ways to combine uh, simulation with best practices in scientific computing, heuristics and deep learning, and differentiable programming, you could also call it, to reuse computation in simulations and known structure in the forward model to solve an inverse problem. So here we see all sorts of different flavors, all sorts of different flavors, where you have your simulator, you have your forward model equations, and you have some prior knowledge. I would say what I'm gonna show today is this, is B, where you have a simulator and you have some, it acts as a, uh, you approximate the posterior. So I'll explain how that works. And I would see what I'm working on, I'm very much inspired by you know, Steve's work and, and um, definitely some work that uh, Ellen and, and others at DeepMind published uh, uh, recently. And, and, uh, and it's very related to what recently came out of the Slack group leading up to the NeurIPS workshop. So these are coordinate based methods, point clouds or or kind of stronger assumptions about how atoms are coupled together. Um, there's, you can also introduce regularizing terms to express that something is a folded polymer chain. Um, and uh, you know, this is taking it beyond the voxelized treatments that have, that these are the workhorses that people actually use to solve structures. And you can, you know, I've also seen work extending this where you have maybe a, a prior, um, a sort of custom prior that comes from uh, atomistic models, but that kind of goes back into a voxelized expectation maximization treatment. Okay, so I'll talk about the forward model I'm using. It's a very simple form based for heterogeneity, based on balls and springs. So we have, uh, it's a point cloud. It's not necessarily atoms with thick, it's not an, uh, fixed bond links, links. It's not really molecular mechanics uh, term so much. <clears throat> Any 
so from some reference confirmation, like an existing PDB structure, like something that comes, is, comes out of AlphaFold or comes out of Meta AI's uh, kind of uh, similar approach, we have a way of scoring any other point cloud. So it's an energy-based model where we get some energy, deviations from this. This also assumes the minimum energy is at that reference point cloud. And because of the squared structure of this, the partition function, we can normalize this. We can get a normalized probability and, it's, and uh, analytically. How? We take that, um, we approximate that energy further, which is already pretty simple, by uh, computing the Hessian of that and then neglecting further terms. So that's an approximation. And what this allows us to do, so we, we have to do this in memory, we have to do this computationally. Every time we have a new reference cloud, uh, we would have to recompute this. But then once we have that, the uh, scalars, we can project from our new sampled cloud onto scalars through these uh, eigenvectors. And these eigenvectors are ranked by their uh, level of fluctuation, by their, by their yeah, level of fluctuation. And so we make a deterministic change of basis to a set of scalars by committing to some pre-computed uh, vector fields, where each atom has its own little displacement vector. And then we don't have to use all of them. We could truncate that uh, and rank them by their eigenvalues. And so what this means, what this looks like mathematically, is the probability of sampling some point cloud is the probability of sam sampling some Gaussians, univariate Gaussians. And in fact, this is how multivariate uh, Gaussians are implemented at the back end of scientific computing programs. If you want to sample some multivariate Gaussian with some covariance matrix, you, you do do eigen decomposition. And then you just sample uh, single univariate Gaussians. So what does this mean back to our, back to our picture, our cartoon here? We have some point cloud, some reference point cloud in black. From that are computed our, uh, our normal modes, our anisotropic normal modes our, our, from our ball and springs model. We only choose uh, a finite number of them. Here I've just chosen one to keep it simple. And then uh, Gaussian scalars sampled, and that would be different from each, from each image, and there's perturbations along that component. And if you want to express more heterogeneity, you use more eigenmodes. That gives you a perturbed point cloud, which is then, you sample a rotation, that gets rotated. I wrote a fast projection kernel to numerically do the uh, projection of a point cloud and, and, and evaluate Gaussian blobs in a 2D array. And then there's just regular Fourier convolution for the CTF and noise. Now I just use this data set of, that was the same one used in the DeepMind paper. It's a kinase. It's a, it's a very small protein, so I, I don't even think you could actually solve the structure on experimentally with such a small protein. This is another look at what I just explained, the forward model. So we have our Gaussian scalars that are sampled. Here it's written n-dimensionally, but this would be single for one, one component. 
there's an additive perturbation along that pre-computed mode, depending on what that sampled Gaussian scalar is, this heterogeneity scalar. This is tying together all the atoms. A rotation is sampled. I just worked with a 2D uh, in-plane problem to start with. And so the rotation about the z-axis comes from that sampled rotation. And then there's a sampling of the clean projection, or a compu deterministic computation of the clean projection, sampling of uh, defocus, making the CTF kernel, and then uh, the convolution in Fourier space. And here I also put in, I'll talk about that later, some Fourier cropping. As noted by, um, by you know, Steve and Mu Yuan Chen in their, in their paper, and also in um, Benjamin Himes and Nico Gregoriev's paper, uh, um, multi slice cryo paper, we can uh, take advantage when we work with a, a Gaussian kernel for point clouds, we can take advantage of that it's spherically symmetric, and when you rotate it, it's still a sphere. And so we can do the, instead of numerically, evaluating this in a 3D grid and numerically, and then interpolating, and then numerically summing through an axis, we can do one of the steps in math and, uh, and do this integral over the z-axis in math, which just evaluates to the same constant, so it's just dropped. So what this means is that from a point cloud that's been rotated and perturbed, we can quickly evaluate just over a 2D array and furthermore, because the Gaussian kernel dies so quickly, you only need to simulate a small box of pixels around it. Uh, if it if you, you only need to evaluate a few, a few standard deviations away. And if, they, uh, if, the, if they're just spreading over a few pixels, it just ends up being a small box of pixels. So here are some, here's a, uh, Two panels, one at two different pixel sizes, 64 by 64, and then 512 by 512. And depending on how spread out the atoms are, right, so how magnified you are going, how much damage there's been, how much spreading there is, you have to, if you choose to go to a few standard deviations away so that the Gaussian kernel is evaluating is getting killed off, is only 1% or 0.03% of its peak value, then you need to take a patch bigger and bigger sizes. And uh, if you have a lot of pixels and very, very small pixel size, then you have to extend it. So is this numerically feasible? And the motivation here for getting this at the microsecond range is to be able to do simulation-based inference where you need to evaluate the simulator all the time for Monte Carlo-based methods, for end-to-end -end differentiable methods, where every gradient step you want to be evaluating the simulator. There's two panels here. This is the runtime of the simulator for, for that um, kinase I showed. And here you see there's a pre-computation step that's just done once. And then this would be done every, every time there's new latents, new defocus, uh, new rotation, new, um, new A&M deformations, new heterogeneity. And I can get it down to, um, for patch sizes, you know, in this range, there's a sweet spot where it's, it's under, you know, it's 50 microseconds, under 100 microseconds. And then this pre-computation is also just very trivially fast. And this helps speed up. This is pre-computation that's done to help with the vectorization over atoms. Some batch indices that are the same throughout, no matter what the state of the latents are. Okay, one remark about forward cropping, and this is just one approach to coarse graining the forward model. We, th we could think about other approaches of coarse grain in the forward model are representing how many uh, Gaussians you would have, for instance. You could coarse grain and group together things and, and represent them at a lower fidelity information. 
it's, this is nothing new in, in CarEM data analysis, but how do we use this with a neural net? Because if we're going to Fourier crop, then we have a different uh, grid size, and would we have to retrain? So the Fourier cropping happens in this step here, and I'll show some results, some initial results, where the highest uh, resolution is at 64, and there's these two intermediate regimes. And because of the Gaussian noise, you, you see how, see there's salt and pepper noise here, but because it, what forward cropping does is basically pooling random variables nearby. Uh, uh, a Fourier crop is like a big top hat filter in Fourier space, so it's getting, a top hat filter is going and convoluting, and in the, in the case of going ha half the amount of pixels down, uh, two by two patch is being averaged together. You can see some of the noise is killed. And we know exactly how the uh, noise changes with that factor of Fourier cropping. So we can match the, if we know the background original uh, noise level, we can match uh, the deterministically transformed measurement uh, to a simulation. We, we know this uh, noise level with other types of uh, likelihoods that wouldn't necessarily be the case. You wouldn't know how to change the variance. So for the in inverse problem, um, I'm just doing a plain vanilla um, stochastic variational inference where I'm, there are some neural nets uh, consuming the measurements and then outputting distributional parameters for each measurement of what to sample. And there's, it's, it's, I say plain vanilla because it's a, there's no dependency assumed. It's just a mean field approximation where the inference graph, uh, 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 independently, there's three independent networks that have no weight sharing. They just independently propose the latents. And with this objective, with the elbow, the optimizing it, uh, 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 fits this uh, guide artifact to the posterior. So it's a, I'm, I'm learning a approximation of the, of the posterior with this variational posterior. So it's, what's, yeah, so the, each measurement, batches of measurements go in and have uh, distribution parameters deterministically computed from them. For each of those, there's a sampling of a latent. They don't necessarily have to be Gaussian, they don't have to be standard Gaussian, they can be mixtures of things, they can have directional information and be on uh, uh, SO3 manifold for rotation. And then that gives us our sampled latents, which then are scored under this interpretable deterministic forward model. Here are some initial results for uh, pose, predicting uniform pose and then pose uh, and the heterogeneity. Okay, so there's three regimes here. There's Fourier cropping happening in this. There's, this is just on pose. And so what's happening in this regime is that the elbow is being optimized where the simulation is coarse graining things and matching with a coarse grain measurement. And at the end of that, this is the this is on synthetic data, so we compare the ground truth against the uh, uh, sampled values. And we see uh, some sort of contours on the diagonal. There's also these off-diagonal uh, peaks that get more pronounced at the medium resolution, but start to uh, become less populated at higher resolution. So what's going on here? Why are these streaks here? Well, the object at lower resolutions has a, in that 2D view, has, I guess, a pseudosymmetry enough that there's a, if it's flipped 180 degrees, so those streaks are exactly off 180 degrees, there's basically two streaks that are wrapping around and making three lines. And when this is flipped 180 degrees, there's a little blip in the likelihood for a local minima. It's also a two-component mixture. If it would be a richer, higher component mixture, there might be more streaks. The, 
The okay, so now for joint. Well, it's it's not yeah joint and imposed. It's joint in the sense that in the end you're getting at predictions for both. But uh, every gradient step updating parameters for both heterogeneity and pose, I think it, it's not working for me, and I think it's not working because the um, the variance of one is on a different scale, and so. Uh, it's signal of, of what direction to go and is swamped by the other uh, latent. And so what I had to do, and I got this idea from, from Crowd Dragon 2 of having these uh, frozen um, regimes where you, where you fix uh, and you use your, your, your estimates from one latent and train the other and then fix one and train the other. So this is uh, at the end of, of jointly tra of training for predicting uh, pose and ANM, the correlation, there's the, yeah, so there's some spread, you know, if you look at the contours, there's mainly uh, diagonal, uh, highly populated diagonal, and here we see for the ANM. So what does this, what does this mean? Each, each dot is a particle, it has some actually synthetically created ground truth angle and, and A&M scalar, and then after it uh, goes through these neural networks and produces some parameters that express not only uh, uh, a mean but also some variance of where it should be sampled that produce some distribution, then this is the sample from that distribution. In conclusion, I've showed a Ford model that um, yields a trace, yields a set of latents and some probability and the, their probabilities. And I've used SVI to do inference for 2D pose and NM based heterogeneity. The uh, schedule for cropping uh, coarse grains of simulation and can I've I've shown a simple regime where it's fixed. It could, could, it could change, it could go up, it could um, be much more granular. It could only change by a few Fourier pixels each uh, cropping stage. And in future work, I'd like to explore having priors over the initial atomic reference, mixtures of them, or some other more complex prior and uh, breaking the mean field approximation and conditioning on samples. This is something that was done in uh, Rosenbaum's uh, DeepMind team, their paper, where they predicted uh, uh, global, global rotation and heterogeneity, and depending on what that sample latent was, included that in the, another network. And then also um, to to do something with the uncertainty in the latents. So if we, if there's some image and its, its, um, its rotation is only known to a certain amount, you, you, you don't expect the high frequency information to match well with the measurement. And, uh, and, there, and, uh, and that can be propagated through the equations of this forward model and perhaps give some heuristics for how to modify the likelihood to be more robust, to have different regimes during training where the reduces the variance of the gradient signal. And I'd like to thank the team, the team at UBC, CAN, and uh, uh, Frank Wood, who taught me probabilistic programming, and uh, one of my main collaborators, Boyan. Also, uh, Marcus. Uh, Brubaker at, at U of T in York and his student Cheyenne. Uh, they were really involved in the, in the second uh, work I did. And also um, a lot of, so I had been thinking about these normal modes actually on maps in this really crude way in around 2018 I had showed some initial results to David Fleet and been thinking about it and, and then um, Talked a little bit with some of the developers of Pro Prode, Protein Dynamics, and Eva Bahar's group. And then um, Ken put me in touch with this team at Slack, Fred and, and Youssef, 
who had a clear method, had a clear vision of how to put this in end-to-end -end differentiable approaches. And, and Fred has a strong background in um, structural biology and molecular dynamics and is really interested in extending things to force fields, atomic force fields. And uh, there's a kind of consortium group of, of, uh, of people hoping to um, uh, develop computational methods in a way that can um, have some reference data sets and, uh, and, and methods that are, you can take and, and swap uh, components of them and invent new ones. And uh, that's part of this computational single particle imaging consortium that Nina and, and Fred and others are pioneering. Okay, thank you for your attention. <laughs>